Candlelight by Tuesday Love Sang Rampa Read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful BC Candlelight Intro and Short Poem The faint flickering gleam of fourteen little candles shines forth into the world, bringing to a vast number of people some of the light of astral knowledge. The sunlight is waning. Coming fast is the end of the day. The darkness of communism is, by stealth and treachery, engulfing the world faster and faster. Soon the light of freedom will be extinguished for a time, while mankind ponders opportunities lost and regrets warnings unheeded. But even in the darkest hour there shall be the gleams of little candles bringing hope to a stricken world. The darkest hour is before the dawn, and that hour is not yet. The gloom and despondency of evil men usurping power shall be lessened by the knowledge that all suffering shall eventually pass, and the sunlight shall shine again. Candlelight may bring illumination to some and hope to others. Sunlight gives way to darkness. Darkness gives way to sunlight. But even in the deepest dark, a candle may show the way. A poem from an admirer. You are old, Father Rampa, the young man exclaimed, and the press for too long have you defamed. The candles you lit gleam both near and far, sending out light like a welcoming star. You are old, Father Rampa, the young man said. Put aside your typing. It's time that you died. Your life has been hard and your experience is grim, but the candles you lit will never grow dim. You are old, Father Rampa, the young man said. Your candles will flame long after you're dead. The truths you have taught will enrich our way. The hardships you suffered, was it too much to pay? Freed from suffering, freed from sorrow, freed from worries about tomorrow, freed from the toils of this bad earth, freed from the circle of endless rebirth. Your life flame flickers and ends one day. But the candles you lit will show us the way. With apologies to all and everyone who merits an apology. Chapter 1 The sullen clouds came lowering out of the steel sky and began to weep. A thin veil of pattering raindrops scudded across the dirt roofs of Montreal and ended up as rivulets of sooty black in the garbage-cluttered gutters. The tempo of the downpour increased. The swirling rainstorms blotted out the bridges, the tall, ugly buildings, and then even the port itself. Suddenly the trees leaned over, water pouring from depressed leaves, forming scummy puddles over the sparse grass. In the distance a ship hooted forlornly, as though in despair at having again to enter Montreal, the city of two tongues. Glumly, the cats sat before the fogged-up window and wondered if the sun would ever shine again. Outside, on the flooded roadway, a tattered copy of a French-language newspaper blew to its rightful home, in a sewer, where it momentarily blocked the water flow, and then vanished in a scurry of gurgling sound. The old blue bus went chuntering along, 
Engine roaring, wheels flinging plumes of water from the flooded road, came a crash as it dropped into the hollow by the office. Lurching and reeling, it pushed its cumbersome way through the murk and turned right out of sound. There came the ponderous roar of the garbage truck pounding its way along the road. A behemoth shape glimpsed dimly through the unlighted gloom, and then peace, save for the drumming of the rain. The old man in the wheelchair groped for the light switch as he turned away from the steamed window. With the light on, he turned sadly to the pile of letters yet to be answered. Questions, 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 he mumbled. Do they think I'm a free advisory bureau on everything from conception, death with a good dose of the hereafter thrown in? The letter from the lady in a large USA city was interesting. I have read all thirteen of your books, she wrote. A good author would have told all that and more in one half chapter. Gee, madam, well, thanks. But here they come. A very, very cross women's lib gangster from Winnipeg. Doesn't like me a bit. Thinks I hate women. Well, she is not a woman. Anyhow, more like a drunken buck navvy from her language. Women, I love em. Men and women, just the opposite sides of the coin. Why should I hate them? What a touchy lot some of these women are. Ugh, fooey. But the minute minority do not matter. Most, about ninety-nine per cent, true are sincerely interested in what I write and just love my candles. They want to know more about all aspects of metaphysics, how to levitate, how to teleport, how to do this and how to do that. Quite a number of people have become increasingly interested in dowsing and pendulums. There's a letter here from a person who saw a man walking across a field. Suddenly the forked stick, which the man was holding, twitched violently. The correspondent tells me that this person was a water diviner. And please, would I say if there is anything in this business of dowsing and using a pendulum? Yes, most definitely. Dowsing is a genuine thing, if one knows how to use the hazel or other forked twig. Most definitely there is something in pendulums, provided the person knows what he or she is doing, and it's not just putting on a stage turn to impress the unwary. First, we have to know what causes these things to work. At the present time, with radio commonplace, it is not at all difficult to get over the idea that there are certain currents or certain waves which a person cannot detect without some intermediary. For example, is a horrible commotion which, fortunately, we cannot hear. But radio waves are coming in from everywhere. AM, FM, long wave. One just cannot perceive them. But let us get a mysterious piece of equipment between the incoming waves and the loudspeaker or television tube, and then we get a noise or we get pictures. The mysterious piece of apparatus is connected, usually, to some substance, in this case the aerial, which receives the incoming waves and then takes them to the interior of the mysterious box, where all sorts of wires and bits of copper and mica or paper, etc., sort out the jumble and detect 
a coherent signal. Then it passes on to another section of the box where it is amplified and its speed of frequency is reduced to that which can be dealt with. From the amplifier it goes to the output stage and thence onto the speaker or to a television tube and speaker and then we get something which approximates more or less the original noise which was broadcast or to the original picture which was broadcast. Of course, that is oversimplifying rather dreadfully, because in addition to having the incoming signals, we have to have a method of collecting the signals, detecting the signals, amplifying them and putting them to output. But, and we must not forget this, we have to have a method of tuning to the frequency or wavelength to which we desire to listen or watch. Radio and dowsing are very much the same thing. The signals we receive in dowsing, let's forget all about dowsing, shall we? Actually, unless a person is going to douse for water only out in the blue yonder, there is no point in having hazel twigs or aluminum twigs or all sorts of wonderful glorified versions of hazel twigs. It's much better and more convenient to use a pendulum, which does everything a dowsing rod can do and much, much more. So, let us just refer to pendulums because, unless you're a farmer in the wildest part of Australia, where you can perhaps cut a suitable twig at any moment, there's no point in cluttering yourself with a lot of lumber. A pendulum is a lump of material attached to something which will not constrict its movements. A little later we'll discuss different types of pendulums, but basically the radiations which can be indicated by a pendulum are radiations in some way similar to radio. They are radiations transmitted by all and every material as it decomposes or gets ready to change state. We know for example, that throughout countless years, radium decays into lead. We know that all matter is a whole horde of molecules hopping about like fleas on a hot plate. The smaller the fleas, the faster they can jump. The bigger the fleas, the slower and more cumbersome. So it is with material. Everything has its atomic number, number of atoms indicating how slowly it's going to vibrate, or how fast it's going to vibrate. So all we do in pendulum work is to tune in to some atomic vibrations and, if we know how, we can tell which one it is and where it is. When we are dealing with radio, we have an aerial system which absorbs or attracts or intercepts, call it what you like, the waves coming through the atmosphere. Perhaps they're bounced back by the heavy side layer or the Appleton layer, but in addition, there is a ground wire which makes contact with the ground wave, because you must have two, positive and negative, in everything. You can take the ground wave as negative and the air wave as positive. So, in the matter of pendulums, the human body collects the air wave, acting as the antenna or aerial, and the feet in contact with the ground act as the earth connection or the ground. And for correct pendulum work it is necessary to keep the balls of the feet on the ground unless one uses another method of tapping the earth current. Of course 
Using a pendulum is simplicity itself. It is even simpler than simplicity if we know why a thing works. That's why you are getting this long collection of words which might at first strike you as a rigmarole. It's not. Until you know what you are doing, you can't tell when you are doing it. Pendulums really work. Many Japanese tell the sex of unborn babies by use of a pendulum. They use a gold ring suspended on a piece of string or thread and it's held above the stomach of the pregnant woman. The direction or type of movement indicates the sex of the child yet to be born. Incidentally, many Chinese and Japanese use a pendulum for sexing eggs. A radio set uses electric current for reproducing sound which was broadcast from some distant station. Television sets use current also for reproducing a rough simulacrum of the picture transmitted from a distant station. So, in the same way, if we're going to douse or use a pendulum or anything else, we have, first of all, to have a source of current. And the best source of current we can use is the human body. After all, our brains are really storage batteries, telephone exchanges, and all that sort of thing. But the main thing is, it is a source of electric current sufficient for all our needs and sufficient to enable us to detect impulses and thereby cause a pendulum to twitch, swirl, gyrate or oscillate or all the other queer things which a pendulum does. So, to work a pendulum, we must have a human body an alive human body at that. You cannot tie a pendulum to a hook and expect it to work because there would be no source of current. Nor would it be of much use if we could tie our pendulum to a hook and supply it with a current because the current has to be in pulses varying according to the type of action desired. Just as in radio, we have high notes, low notes, loud notes, and soft notes, so with the pendulum, we must have the necessary current variation to do the necessary. Who is going to vary the current? Well, the over-self, of course. That is the brightest citizen we have around us, you know. After all, you who read this are just one-tenth conscious, so knowing yourself, just think how brilliant you would be if you could call in the other nine-tenths of consciousness. You can certainly enlist its aid, the aid of the subconscious. The subconscious is brilliant. It knows everything that you have ever known. It can do everything that you could ever do, and it can remember every single incident since long before you were born. So, if you could touch your subconscious, you would get to know a very considerable amount of things, wouldn't you? You can touch your subconscious with practice and with confidence. The subconscious can also contact other subconscious minds. There are, truthfully, no limits to the powers of the subconscious mind. And when the subconscious mind is allied to other subconscious minds, then, indeed, results may be achieved. We cannot just ring up a telephone number and ask to speak to our subconscious because we have to look 
upon that mind as being something like a very absent-minded professor who is constantly sorting knowledge, storing knowledge, and acquiring knowledge. He's so busy that he can't bother with other people. If you pester him enough, in the politest way, then he may answer your summons. So first of all, you have to become familiar with your subconscious. You see, the whole thing is that the subconscious is the greater part of you, the much greater part of you, and I suggest that you give your subconscious a name. Call him or her, whatever you like, so long as it's a name agreeable to you. Supposing it's a male, then you could, purely as an illustration, use the name George. Or, if it is the subconscious of a female, then you could say Georgina. But the whole point is that you must have some definite name which you link inseparably with your subconscious. So, when you want to get in touch with your subconscious, you could say, for example, George. George, I want your help very much. I want you to work with me. I want you to, and here you'd specify what it is you want, and remember, George, that we really are all one, and what you do for me you're also doing for yourself. You need to repeat that slowly and carefully and with very great thought. Repeat it three times. The first time, George will probably shrug his mental shoulders and say, Oh, that pestiferous fellow bothering me again when I've got so much work to do. And he will turn back to his work. The next time you repeat it, he will pay more attention because he is being bothered, but he still won't take any action. But if you repeat it a third time, George or Peter or Dave or Bill or whoever it is, well, get the idea that you're going to keep on until you get some action. So he will give a metaphorical sigh and help. This is not a fantasy, it's a fact. I claim to know quite a lot about it because for more years than I care to remember, I have done just this. My own subconscious is not called George, by the way, but a name which I do not reveal to anyone else, just as you should not reveal to anyone else the name of your subconscious. I never laugh or joke about it, because this is deadly serious. You are only one-tenth of a person. Your subconscious is nine-tenths, so you have to show respect. You have to show affection. You have to show that you can be trusted, because if you do not gain the cooperation of your subconscious, then you won't do any of the things that I write about. But if you practice what you're reading, you can do a whole lot. So, make friends with your subconscious. Give him or her a name, and be sure that you keep that name very, very private indeed. You can talk to your subconscious. It's better if you talk slowly and repeat things. Imagine that you're telephoning someone on the other side of the world, and the telephone line is a bit poor. You have to repeat yourself. You have quite a difficult time making yourself understood. Your listener at the other end of the telephone line is not an idiot for having difficulty in understanding your message. But general communications are bad, and if you overcome the difficulties of communications, you can then find 
that you have a very intelligent conversationalist, one who is far more intelligent than you are. When you're using the pendulum, and we'll go into that in more detail in a moment or so, you have to keep your feet flat on the ground so that the balls of your feet are in contact with the floor and then you have to say something like subconscious or the name you have chosen I want to know what I must do to get success at such and such a thing if you are going to make the pendulum work will you make it swing backwards and forwards to indicate yes and from side to side to indicate no, just as a human does when he nods for yes and shakes his head for no. You have to get over a message like that about three times. You have to explain very slowly, very clearly, and very carefully indeed what you want your subconscious to do and what you expect of the test because if you don't know what you want then how the, can the subconscious give you any information the subconscious won't know either if you don't know what you want you don't know when you found it we started with dowsing so let us deal first with what we call the dowsing pendulum by the way a little digression. Shall we refer to all subconsciousness as George for the purpose of this instruction? The dowsing pendulum should be a ball, possibly an inch or an inch and a quarter, in diameter. If you can get a very good wooden pendulum, so much the better. Or you may be able to obtain a neutral metal one. But for the moment, any pendulum will do, as long as it's about an inch or an inch and a quarter in diameter. You should get a piece of thread, such as what bootmakers use for stitching on soles. I believe it's called cobbler's thread. You'll need about five feet of it. Tie one end to your pendulum, which should have a little eyelet on the top for that purpose. Tie the other end to a rod or even to an empty cotton reel. Then wind all the thread onto the cotton reel so that when you hold the small cotton reel in the palm of your hand, the thread holding the pendulum is between the finger and thumb of your right hand. Your right hand, if you write with that one, but if you use your left hand instead, then of course the pendulum will be in the left hand. But first, we have to sensitize or tune our pendulum for the particular type of material we wish to locate. Supposing we're going to look for a gold mine. First of all, you get a little piece of sticky tape about an inch long is sufficient and then you put just a very small piece of gold scraped from inside a ring for instance onto the sticky tape and then just lightly push it onto the pendulum then your pendulum has a piece of gold which will sensitize it to that metal and when I say scrape, I mean that even if you get a grain, that will be adequate. When you have that, put your ring or another piece of gold between your feet as you stand up. Stand with this gold, such as gold ring or a gold watch, between your feet. And slowly, Unwind the thread so that your pendulum lowers to perhaps a foot and a half from your fingers. At this point, the pendulum should swing in a circular direction. That is, making a complete circle. If it does not do so, 
lower the thread a little or pull it up a little, the point being you have to ascertain the length of thread at which the pendulum swings most freely for gold. When you have determined that, it may be 18 or 20 or 22 inches or similar, you make a knot in the thread and you write down the exact length, such as knot 1, gold. And then you pull off your gold specimen with the cellophane tape and pick up your watch or ring and put a silver article on the floor. It may be a coin or a piece of silver you've pinched from somebody else, but it must be silver. You also put a very fine scraping of silver on another piece of cellophane tape and put that on your pendulum. Then you try again to find what is the correct length for silver. When you've done that, you can make another note such as not too silver. You can go on doing it for different metals, and not only different metals, but different substances. If you make a proper table, then you should have great fun prospecting. Generally, you'll find that in terms of length, the first thing to respond at about 12 inches in length is stonework. A bit longer thread and you'll get glass or china ware. Longer still and you'll get vegetable stuff. Go on increasing the length and you'll get silver and lead and then a bit further on you'll find water. Longer still you will find gold. Still longer copper and brass. And the longest will be iron, and iron will be roughly just under 30 inches. So if you want to know what is beneath you, just stand there and first of all think of whatever metal you are looking for. You can adjust the length of your thread to the appropriate distance, and you very slowly walk forward. Again, again, it is emphasized and re-emphasized that you must tell George precisely what you are doing. You have to tell him that you want to prospect for gold, iron, silver, or whatever it is, and when he senses the radiations, will he please swing the pendulum. At all times, you must definitely keep thinking very strongly of that which you hope to find. Otherwise, if you change over and think of something else, then you won't get it. Apropos of this, let me say that if you are looking for antique porcelain, for instance, and you suddenly think of women, then you will get the reaction for gold, because the length of thread for gold, and for women, is precisely the same. And if a woman thinks about men, she will get the reaction as if there was a diamond under the ground. That, of course, means that you will be completely misled. It would never do if you got the reaction for a diamond, so you grab a shovel and pick up and dug, but found instead a dead man. It could happen. Now, it is advisable to use a shorter cord pendulum for everyday indoor use. After all, you don't want three, four, or five feet of thread getting tangled up every day, so when you are indoors, use a separate pendulum. The pendulums, which can be obtained commercially already, have a thread or a chain attached to them, and frequently the chain is possibly six inches long although the exact length varies, but that is of no moment. Suppose you want to find something. 
Suppose you want to find out if a person is living in a certain area. Then you sit down at a desk or a table. But it must be an ordinary desk or table with no drawers or anything beneath because if you have anything beneath, for example, such as a drawer, then the pendulum will be influenced by whatever is in the drawer. You may have a kitchen knife in the drawer. You may have a gold ring or something like that, and the pendulum, no matter how hard you think, will be influenced by the wrong subject. So, sit at a plain table and have within arm's reach some sheets of ordinary plain white paper. Then you tell your pendulum, or rather you tell George, exactly what you want. You say, for example, Look, George, I want to find if Maria Bugsbottom lives in this area. If she does, will you please nod by giving the pendulum a backwards and forwards movement. And if she does not, will you please shake the pendulum from side to side? Then, on the right-hand side of the table, you have your piece of white paper. And on the top, which is far away from you, you put yes. And on the bottom, which is close to you, you put yes. On the far left side of the paper, you put no, and on the far right side of the paper, no. And in the center, you put a little X to show that is the spot over which you're going to hold the pendulum. The pendulum, by the way, should be held about two inches above that X. Sit comfortably. It doesn't matter if you have your shoes on or off, but you must have your feet on the floor, not on the bars of a chair. Have them flat on the floor, so that the balls of your feet are in contact with the floor. Then you get a map of the area desired and spread it to your left, so that you have a white sheet of paper to the right and your map on the left. First, you gently take the pendulum all over the area of the map, saying, Look, George, this is the area of my map. Is Maria Bugsbottom anywhere within this area? The pendulum is being taken over the map about two inches above the surface. When you have covered the whole area, you say, George, I am now going to start this investigation. Will you help me, George? Will you indicate yes or no, as the case may be? Then, if you are right-handed, put your right elbow comfortably on the table and suspend your pendulum by its thread or chain. Hold the thread or chain between your thumb and fourth finger, the finger with which you point. See that the pendulum is about two inches above the X. Special note here, if you're left-handed, everything will have to be reversed. But for the right-handed people in the majority, well, go by the instructions conveyed above. Having got ready and making sure that you're not likely to be disturbed, tell George that you are now ready to start work. Look at the map and put your left forefinger along the road on the map where you think Maria Bugsbottom may be living. Give an occasional glance at the pendulum. It may swing idly without any apparent sense, but if you get to where you believe your friend or enemy is living, then the pendulum will definitely indicate yes or no. It's a good idea to use a small scale map first so that you can cover the biggest area. But when you get some sort of indication, as if George was saying, this is a big area, 
I need to get closer than this. Then you get a large scale map so that you can, with practice, locate any individual house. After each test, you definitely must replace your sheet of white paper by another. Oh, you can use it for writing on, write letters on it, or anything else, but only one sheet of white paper to one reading, because you have impregnated that sheet with the impressions of whatever you are trying to find out, so that if you try to repeat a reading, then the second reading will be influenced by the first, and, well, that's all there is to it. But no, perhaps that's not all there is to it, because after all, you've really got to frame your questions properly. George, you see, is a single-minded individual who can't take a joke, and is extremely and exceptionally literal. So, it's no good you saying, George, can you tell me if Maria Bugsbottom lives there? If you ask a question like that, the answer will be yes, because George can tell you if Maria Bugsbottom lives there. He can. And that is what you are asking. You're asking with a question in that form if the pendulum can tell you. You're not asking if she actually is living there at the moment. So, whatever question you ask must be framed in such a way that George is not in a state of confusion. The biggest difficulty about the whole affair is framing the questions so that they are foolproof so that there are no double meanings to them. In any question, if you say, Can you tell me? Then the answer will be yes or no to the question of Can you tell me? The other part of the question, If Maria Bugsbottom lives there? The other part of the question will be unanswered because the first question will have swamped George's interest. So, until you are more practice at this, how about writing out your questions first and looking at your words to see if there's any way at all in which the question can be regarded as ambiguous or as having a double meaning or is unclear. Let me repeat in big bold black capitals, you must be sure of what you are asking before you can pose the question. Of course, when you have some practice, it's quite easy to trace missing people. You have to have a small scale and a large scale map of the area in which the person is supposed to be missing. Then you have to be able to form some sort of mental picture of the person who is missing. Is it a big boy or a small girl? Is he or she ginger or blonde or black haired? What do you know about the person? You have to brief yourself as fully as possible because, again, unless you know what you are seeking, then you don't know when you've found it. It may happen at times when, for example, you're confined to bed, that you cannot stick your feet plunk on the ground. That's my trouble. So I have a metal wand about two and a half feet long, and I hold that in my left hand, just like an antenna system to a portable radio. In fact, that's what it is. It's an antenna rod from a portable radio. I pick up the wave from that in precisely the same manner as a more mobile person would with two flat feet. 
When I am picking up impressions from a map or a letter, then I use a little propelling pencil, a metal one, and I touch the letter or the map, and then the old pendulum starts to wobble and gives me an answer. Never, 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 never let anyone else touch your pendulum. It's got to be saturated with your own impressions. You should have several pendulums, one of wood, one of neutral metal, that's something like type metal, and, well, you may want a glass one, or you may want a plastic one. You may even have one which is hollow, so you can put a specimen inside instead of sticking it on with cellophane tape. But you will find one pendulum is more responsive than all the others for personal things, and you can make it even more responsive by carrying it on your person, getting it saturated with your own impressions. If you do that, and never let another person use it, or even touch it, then you'll find you have something as potent and as useful as radar is to aircraft on a foggy night. The pendulum cannot be wrong. George cannot be wrong. You can. You can go wrong with the form your questions take and your interpretations of the answers. Now, with computers, one has to use a special language, otherwise the computer cannot make sense of what one is trying to get at. So pretend that your pendulum is a computer and frame your questions in such a clear, one-way form that no possibility of error can occur, because the pendulum can only indicate yes or no. It can indicate uncertainty by doing a figure of eight. It can also indicate what sex a thing or a person is, because most times, for a man, it can rotate in a right-hand circle, clockwise that is. But for a woman it will rotate in a left-hand, anti-clockwise circle. But if the man is very feminine, then the poor old pendulum may go in the wrong way. But it's not actually the wrong way, it's just indicating that the man isn't, he's more female and just has the necessary attachments, as one would say in the best circles, which would enable him to pass physiologically as a male specimen. All his thoughts may be female, so in that way, the pendulum is far better as a judge than the best doctors. Oh, yes, I must be sure to tell you this. Make sure your hands are clean before using the pendulum. Otherwise, if, for instance, you have been gardening or stubbing out a cigarette butt in some poor plant's plump pot home, then you will get a reading for the soil content of the pores of your fingers. So, be sure that your fingers, your hands, are clean. Be sure that your table is clean. It's no good, for instance, turning around and finding that a big fat cat is sitting on a sheet of white paper. And if it is, then you have to use a different sheet of white paper. With the pendulum and practice, you can know how to douse for minerals from a map. You go along looking for gold, if you like, by having a little particle of gold attached to the pendulum. Then you let your finger go along the map to the location where you think there may be gold, and you think strongly of gold to the exclusion of all else. Or, if you're looking for silver, think strongly of silver to the exclusion of all else. All these things are very, very simple.
Until you get used to them, you'll be sure that they're utterly impossible. They are not for you. It is only practice that makes a pilot able to take off in his aircraft and bring it down in one piece. It's only practice and faith in yourself that will enable you to go to your table, produce a map and a pendulum and say, there, there is water, floods of it, and then go to the actual site and find, upon digging, that the water is at a certain depth. You can get a good idea of the depth of a thing by the strength of the oscillation or movement of the pendulum. Now this is not a book on pendulums or dowsing, but practice will soon teach you how to shorten or lengthen the chain or string and how to gauge depth. But remember, again, that you must very definitely and strongly concentrate on that which you want to find or know. You can also find out a lot about a person by using a pendulum over the signature on the letter. It's quite a useful exercise. But remember, you must be sure of what you want to know. You must be sure of what you are asking. Because if you are asking a thing in two parts, then George is sure to answer the wrong one. And be very certain that you tell your subconscious George, or whatever you're calling him or her, precisely what you are trying to find out and what you expect the pendulum to do to indicate the information you desire. Since writing the above, I have tried it on the dog, because it seemed clear enough to me, but then I know it all, so I got someone who did not know it all to read it and now I'm going to give some supplementary information. Well, how does one hold this pendulum? One rests one's elbow on the table, as already stated, and it should be the right elbow for a right-handed person and the left elbow for a left-handed person. Then you bend your arm so that your hand is at such a height from the table that your pendulum, which is suspended at the end of its chain, rests about two inches above the surface of the table. You actually hold the chain, string or cord, whatever it is, between your thumb and forefinger. And if you want to shorten the chain an inch or so in order to get a better swing, well, do so. Always adjust the length of the chain or thread between your finger and thumb so as to get the best swing or indication. Now, that should be clear enough. You just hold your forearm at such an angle that you are comfortable. You must be comfortable or you will not be able to do pendulum work. Similarly, if you've just had a heavy meal, you will not be able to do pendulum work. Or if you have something bothering you greatly, unconnected with the pendulum, it will distract your attention. You must be in a fairly quiet state of mind, and you must be willing to work with the subconscious. Now, I'm also told, you've got me all confused. You say the over-self is going to vary the current. Well, what is the connection between the over-self and the subconscious? Let us try to get this clear forever and a day and a bit longer. There is you, who is just one-tenth conscious. You are bottom man on the ladder, or you might even be bottom woman on the ladder. Above you, you have your subconscious, and your subconscious is like the operator who controls the switchboard, etc. 
which is your brain. The subconscious is in touch with you through your brain, and through your joint brain would perhaps be a better term, and the subconscious is also in touch with your over-self. So, it's like you, the ordinary poor worker who cannot get a word with the manager. You have to go through the shop steward or the foreman first. So you sort of hang around, try to make yourself obtrusive in the hope that the shop steward or the one above you will notice you and wondering why the you-know-what you're not at work will come and see what it's all about. Then you have to get your point of view over to the shop steward or a foreman and persuade him to take up your case with the manager or whoever is above him. Well, this is similar conditions with the over-self and you. Before you can get through to your over-self, you have to enlist the aid of your subconscious. And once you can convince your subconscious that it's really necessary for your joint good, then the subconscious will contact the over-self, and the pendulum will be varied according to the indications which you are perceiving. Incidentally, if you can get through to your over-self by way of the subconscious, you can cure a lot of illnesses which you may have. The over-self is like the president of a company, and he doesn't always know what minor ailments affect the lower departments. He knows it in times when conditions are very, very serious, but often he's in complete ignorance of some grievance which the lower order of workers have. But if you can get your shop steward to take up the matter with the over-self, or president, or general manager, then a grievance can be settled before it becomes serious. So, if you have a persistent ache here, there, or somewhere else, then keep on at George or Georgina. Say clearly what the trouble is. What is this pain? What does it feel like? Why do you have it? And will the subconscious please see that you are cured? The over-self is the unapproachable. The subconscious is the link between you, the one-tenth conscious, and the over-self, which is the all-conscious. Oh, sure, of course, the pendulum can help you pick the winner of a race if you phrase your question sensibly. But look at this. Can you tell me who will win the 230 race? Now, what sort of question is that? Look at it seriously, and you will see that you're asking your subconscious to tell you this. Can you, subconscious, tell me who will win the race? And the answer will be, yes, of course. And if you get a yes in answer to your question, you would think you were being fooled, wouldn't you? You can't do it that way at all. Read back a bit to where I tell you how to locate things on a map. Now, in this case, if you want to know who's going to win a certain race, you'll have to get a list of horses, the horses who are going to run in that specific race. And you'll have to think definitely, will this horse win? And you'll have to bring the pencil in your left hand slowly down to each name in turn, leaving it there about 30 seconds and thinking about that horse for about 30 seconds, asking if this horse will win the race. If the answer is no, then go on to the next horse until you've got to the one that is going to win. You can do it with practice. It's not very moral, you know, 
because betting and gambling are bad things, but anyway, that's your own responsibility. I'm just trying to make absolutely clear to you that you won't get any satisfactory result unless you quite definitely phrase your question in such a manner that there is only one question involved, a question which can be answered by a plain yes or a plain no. I suggest you read that bit again, because otherwise you're going to be really cross when you get a mixed-up answer, which really will be a mixed-up questioner. The last question here is, Yes, but where do I buy these pendulums? Actually, they are fairly difficult to obtain because so many quick money operators are out to make a fast buck and they are selling absolute junk. Little things like keychain ornaments which they swear is a pendulum with your birthstone attached or something. But that is utterly useless. I'm going to persuade Mr. Souter to stock really reputable pendulums of a special type. There will be wooden ones and there will be neutral metal ones. And the metal ones will also have a recess or opening so you can place a specimen inside such as a piece of hair picked up from a missing person's hairbrush or something like that. In that way, the missing person can be missing no longer. Mr. Souter of Touchstones of England will also be able to supply you with books. I will give you his address later at the end of this chapter. But I do repeat again that it is utterly useless to buy a cheap little junk affair which is just a gimmick to get money out of your reluctant pocket. If you want a thing, you have to pay for it. And a worthwhile pendulum will cost anything from 15 to $30, let's say in English terms from 5 to 10 pounds. But you would pay that willingly for a small transistor radio and a good pendulum is by far more useful to you than the aforementioned transistor radio. With a pendulum you can find a fortune if you read this chapter properly and if you do really serious practice. Practice is the key to everything. You cannot be a great pianist unless you practice. The more important the pianist, the more he or she practices. Hours a day of those silly scales going plonk, plonk, plonk. <laughs> it's the same with the pendulum. You have to practice and practice and practice so you can do it by instinct. And you can practice with people's letters, with metals, and all the rest of it. And that's the way you will make a success. Practice, practice, practice. Oh yes, there's one other little point which I should mention. I will mention it, but literally I would expect that the ordinary rules of politeness would apply. It is very, very important indeed that after you've used your pendulum, you clasp it in your two hands to your forehead and then you solemnly thank George or Georgina for assisting you in this reading. Thank you three times. Do not forget that because if you do not thank him or her according to the elementary rules of politeness, you may not get a response in two or three times hence, and remember your thanks must be repeated thrice just as your requests have been. I am informed that there is some slight ambiguity in one part of this chapter. 
Probably the whole thing is ambiguous, but let's not dig up that problem. Okay, I am told that I do not make it clearer how some poor wretch should stand when he or she is tuning the pendulum with a lump of gold or a crummy bit of silver between the feet. Okay, here it is again. You get your gold, silver, tin, lead, or copper, and you put it on the ground between your feet. Then you stand upright with your spine straight and your left arm down by your side. Then you elevate your right hand so that your forearm is parallel to the ground. And you see if that is a convenient method of doing it because if you brace your right elbow against your side, you will not get undesired wobbles or squiggles in your pendulum, but only what George dictates. But the main thing, of course, is hold your arm at any distance convenient for you and convenient for the pendulum. And that's all there is to it. You may obtain pendulums, books, and other supplies from Mr. E. Z. Souter, Touchstones Limited, 33 Ashby Road, Loughborough, Leicestershire, England. A note from Blue. I don't think that these people are in business any more forty years later. End of chapter one.